Hello, I'm Professor Elizabeth Torres. I am the Executive Director of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. And I'm Professor Walter Zaharadny, Scientific Director of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. The views and opinions of our guest speakers are not necessarily the views and opinions of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. Neither they may be the views of our sponsors and partners, such as the New Jersey Governor's Council for the Medical Research and Treatments of Autism and the Children's Specialized Hospital. The mission of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence is to educate society about the neurobiology of autism and autistic people's unmet needs across their lifespan. We do this by listening to the perspectives of autistic people, their parents and families, clinicians from interdisciplinary fields and researchers from various fields, including psychology, genetics, engineering, and computer science. We hope to build an all-inclusive community which embraces autistic people as valued members of our society. And we certainly hope that you enjoy the webinar that we are about to present. Thank you very much for joining us. And if you have any questions, please go to our website. Since we sat down with Alfie Cohn in August, COVID has continued to impact the world as we as a society, young and old, have endured varying degrees of physical and emotional trauma, loss of loved ones, isolation, loss of income, food insecurity, worries of physical safety, difficulties in accessing education, and more. For the first time, thanks to remote learning, parents on a large scale have had a first-hand look at the education system, while teachers have had a closer view of children's home lives. While parents have witnessed teachers pouring their hearts into teaching their children under extremely difficult circumstances, they've also witnessed many of the shortcomings of our educational system. And parents of neurodivergent, disabled, or otherwise marginalized groups have also seen their children encounter inequities and systemic barriers that have always existed, but are now painfully obvious. Still, others have seen their children th flourish at home during a break from the constraints and expectations of the school day. Many wonder what school will look like when we're finally past this adverse event. While the learning experience children have been accustomed to has been disrupted, questions on whether high stakes testing should be administered or whether grades should be assigned during this time of unrest have led many to wonder whether we will finally pay attention to the research and cease utilizing those measures at all. This experience has also brought to light the imperative of trauma-informed practices and safety in relationships, as well as a focus on social and emotional learning and understanding of neuroscience to best support children, both of which are a current priority of the World Health Organization. Looking beneath the surface to understand the full scope of an individual's human experience, prioritizing intrinsic motivation and strengths, and utilizing what research has shown in brain development, attachment, and human neurobiology to understand a child's perspective and how that influences their emotions, behavior, and learning style has never been more important. In this interview we're about to show you, Mr. Cohn discusses some of the effects of the dominant behavioral paradigm generally used today in many schools and homes, as well as the effects of ABA or applied behavior analysis typically used with autistic children. He argues that manipulation of people's behavior is both morally objectionable and, according to decades of research, unlikely to be effective in the long run. He challenges us to consider our children's experiences and help them to lead self-determined lives. As we head into the new year, perhaps this is a perfect time for a reset, a reevaluation of what we thought we knew, a time for rethinking our priorities and asking ourselves, what do our children really need? and what are we going to do about it? Hi everyone, this is Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJ ACE, and we're here today with Alfie Cohn. Um, Alfie is the author of 14 books on education, parenting, and human behavior, including Punish by Rewards, The Schools Our Children Deserve, Unconditional Parenting, and The Myth of the Spoiled Child. He's appeared twice on Oprah, as well as many other TV and radio programs. His hundreds of articles published in periodicals such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, Parents, and Review of Educational Research 
include five reasons to stop saying good job, it's not about behavior, and why self-discipline is overrated. Cohn works with educators, parents, and therapists across the US and abroad, and he speaks regularly at national conferences. Cohn lives in the Boston area, actually, and virtually at www.alfiecohn.org. Welcome, Alfie. Thank you. Nice to be here. So happy to have you here. Um, so I wanted to quote you, to start out by quoting you, um, which is from one of the articles that you wrote on how to not get a standing ovation at a teacher's conference. And you say, I often discuss the psychological nuances of motivation, but I do not give motivational feel-good talks, the kind that leave no residue the next day. In fact, I'm even aimed beyond being thought-provoking. My hope is to achieve at least something that could be called change-provoking. So today I wanted to talk about the current paradigms in parenting and education, and especially with regard to autism. Um, and there's so much emphasis, emphasis on behavior management and control. And so I feel like one of the breakdowns here is that when you know, these, these uh, approaches are talked about, we kind of miss a piece of the puzzle. And in order for us parents and, you know, people making decisions on what approaches to use with children, I feel that we really need to have informed consent. And the only way we can have that is by having all of the information. Um, and so when I was thinking about like this pandemic, like one of our known unknowns is that like, we don't really know the long-term consequences if people get COVID at this point, but we know that that's like an important thing that we should be considering. And I found it almost like comical that we don't really seem to have the same concerns when we talk about approaches with children. Um, so one of, uh, I guess if you could start by kind of explaining how you see the current paradigms in how we parent and educate children and just, you know, get us going from there. <laughs> I think it is interesting to talk in broader terms about paradigms or theories, even if they're implicit and subliminal, rather than just talking about specific methods or techniques. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you phrased it this way. Um, and there is a giant theory that many people aren't even aware of that informs a lot of what we do as parents and also what educators do and many managers do. And that is a sort of popularized version of behaviorism, which was popularized among academics as well uh, early, earlier in the last century by a guy named Boris Frederick Skinner. Many people know who he is, even if they didn't know that those were his actual names. Yeah. B.F. Skinner, a man who did most of his research with rodents and pigeons and wrote most of his books about people. The assumption here is that humans are essentially like other critters, except for the sophistication of their thinking and verbalizing, that all we have to focus on are observable, measurable behaviors, and that we can divide up those behaviors into little bitty chunks and that people with more power can elicit the behaviors they want from people with less power by dangling the equivalent of doggy biscuits in front of them when they jump through hoops. Um, to a, an alarming extent, this is still the way we talk. For example, any time a, a resource for parents or teachers for that matter is offered a seminar, a webinar, an article, a book, you know, a podcast, mm -hmm. you can judge how um, inadequate that resource is by the number of times the word behavior appears. Because that says, oh no, it's all about Skinnerian manipulation and it's gonna be focusing only on the stuff on the surface that we can look at, ignoring the reasons and motives and values under the surface that inform um, the way people act. In fact, when you talk about children's behavior ad nauseum, you're actually ignoring the children who engage in those behaviors. And chances are you're going to be using some version of a bribe or a threat to try to 
get you the behavior you want, even if we don't use that unpleasant language like bribe or threat. We prefer to make ourselves feel better about what we're doing to children by using terms like positive reinforcement, right. behavior management, or consequences. But it's really about bribes and threats to get obedience. And that basic paradigm is what I've spent a lot of my time in my writing and speaking in, in challenging, in trying to reclaim the experience of children, which is absolutely uh, smashed out of existence by people who focus only on certain behaviors. Yeah, I'm actually in the process of reading both Punished by Rewards and Unconditional Parenting. And um, I loved how you pointed out that it's not about how we think we are treating the child or, you know, we feel that we love them, but it's actually about how they experience that and how they perceive that. For we two reasons. One is for moral reasons that I think we have an obligation to look at, consider, value, and honor the experience of the person on the receiving end, in this case, the child. But also, even if you disagree with that, for purely practical reasons, what predicts to what's going to happen later, what the effects are on the child, you have to know that subjective experience and the way they view us and what we're doing. You know, it just is not particularly useful or informative, or at least it's partial and incomplete, to only look at what, what we're doing, or one step better than that, what our intentions were. Um, yeah, we have to look at it just to understand what's going on. So for, for example, let's take one example. Um, rewards like punishments are ways of doing things to people. You're only likely to get a long-term positive impact if you work with people. I mean, that's simplistic because it's a dichotomy, of course, and it begs the question so far of what constitutes a doing to or a working with intervention. But in general terms, I find that pretty useful. Now, we may convince ourselves we did a doing to approach, like a star chart or stickers, uh, grades, um, various kinds of punitive approaches when they don't do what we want, like forcible isolation, which again, we euphemize by calling it time out. Right. But that's not the way it feels to the child innocuous like that. Um, we may have the best intentions in mind when we use verbal doggy biscuits on children. Good job. I really like the way you, I mean, this makes my skin crawl because it's so fake and manipulative. But even if you don't do it to manipulate a child, even if your conscience is clear and you did it because you were actually genuinely pleased with what the child did, great. My intentions were good. That really doesn't matter if the child experiences it as controlling or inauthentic. Um, or, and this is maybe getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but just to tease what we may talk about in a minute, even if it wasn't about controlling in itself, and I'll talk about different kinds of motivation in a second, mm -hmm. praise and time out communicate conditional affection. By their very nature, all positive reinforcement and all sort of punitive interactions like time out say to kids, I give you attention and acknowledgement and approval only when you please or impress me. Yeah. I, I don't love you for who you are. I love you only for what you do when you do that. And so this is, a, it's not a matter of say, how you phrase the praise. Right. It's not a matter of whether you praise ability versus effort. It's not a matter of whether you overdo it or do it the right amount. All of these verbal doggy biscuits are fundamentally communicating conditional approval. And what children need in order to flourish is not just our love, 
but our love unconditionally, knowing that even when they screw up or fall short, you know, our, our care for them will never diminish. Praise is not only fails to do that, it communicates the exact opposite of that. My love continues only as long as you jump through my hoops. Yeah. Um, and, and I've seen you say that, and this like blew my mind because I had never thought of it that way, but you said that um, praise is judgment. Of course. It's not encouragement. I never thought of it that way before, but it really, I mean, that's it's got it right there. Good job means I, first yeah. of all, it turns children's actions into a job, which I find an odd metaphor, yeah. but it's good job, right? It's at right. its core, it is conditional approval at its core. It is not about encouraging and supporting and loving children. It is about evaluating them to the extent to which they have pleased us. And that is not necessary for socializing and raising children um, or students in a classroom. It is, all, it is a mechanism of control and it tends to be preferred often by the same people who use other forms of judgment and control. Right. Um, there's another, I, you'll see that I really like to use quotes. It helps me remember things. Um, so there was an article that I had saved like last year or the year before, and coincidentally you were quoted in it. Um, but in this article, it's about children learning and the evaluative gaze of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, psychologist Peter Gray says, evaluation when it is not asked for and when it has consequences as it does in school is a threat. It narrows the mind, it inhibits new learning, new insights and creative thought, the very processes that some people think school is supposed to promote. It seems like there's a lot of really good intentions for a lot of this, but like, you know, the intentions don't negate the impact. Um, and so in addition, you know, you've mentioned like praise a lot. So isn't praise still better than consequences or is that a myth? Well, well, first let me just back up a moment and put the gray quote in a little perspective. He is more anti-school than I am okay. I, uh, for two reasons. One is because the concerns about behaviorism that I raise show up not only in school, but often in families and workplaces too. Yeah. So it's not specific to education, but second and more important within an educational context, I think what he and I and you are describing as problematic refer to bad schooling, uh, which is to say very traditional controlling schooling. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily the case. I spent a lot of my time working with teachers on issues that will go beyond what we can talk about this hour, about how not to do that, mm -hmm. how to offer, for example, informational feedback, which is just a description of what you've noticed um, instead of judgment, yay or nay, um, as well as larger questions about how kids can spend more time collaborating instead of being alone or, or competing how the, what's going on, the pedagogy and the curriculum, what they're learning and how is, uh, has the kids have more to say about that, um, that it's more about deep understanding than merely memorizing facts and, and so on. And I think it's possible, and I know it's possible because I've seen it in many schools and classrooms to do it in a different way. Um, to get to the latter part of your question is, is uh, Controlling kids with, uh, with rewards better than controlling them with punishment? Yeah, possibly um, in the same way that I guess time out is better than shooting kids, but that's not much of an argument for time out. The real question is why have we narrowed our scope to looking at control A and control B instead of understanding how much they share and looking for alternatives to both of them. I mean, one could make an argument that in the case of punishment, it's it might actually be preferable in a way because at least it's clear to everybody what's going on. If I say to you, do what, do what I'm telling you or I'm gonna make you suffer, everybody is clear that this is about control and kids can at least rebel against it, which I think is healthy. But if I, if I offer sugar-coated control, 
by offering stickers or stars or food or a chance to play a video game or good job to get to what I want. Not everybody is aware that that constitutes control still, just right. a different kind. It's harder for the kids to take a stand against it and reclaim their autonomy. And it's harder for the parents or teachers or therapists to see what's really going on, offer a critique and look for alternatives. Yeah, like it almost blurs the lines when you when it's posed as a uh, you know two options. It throw like I myself have been thrown off, you know, when being told like, you know, well, this is good. Um, so then in talking about rewards and consequences, um, my question is, does it work? And the answer is, it depends what you mean by work. Um, yeah. Punishments and rewards, and again, I want to emphasize, those are not two separate options. Those are two sides of the same coin. Um, and that coin does not buy very much. Um, uh, one thing that a, re a reward or a punishment can get us is temporary compliance. Not always. Um, sometimes doesn't even get you that. But if the punishment is severe enough and the chances of its being imposed are high enough, or if the reward is big and juicy enough and the chance of getting it is high enough, then yeah, you can get temporary compliance with bribes or threats. If I said to you right now, Jen, I'll give you $1,000 if you take off your shoes. I mean, I'm taking it on pure faith that you're even wearing shoes or for that matter, <laughs> pants. You know, this is the world we live in now. Um, um, but if you were wearing shoes and I said, here's a thousand dollars, if you take them off, would you take them off? Of course you would, right? Yeah. See, rewards work, right? but they never, ever work. They cannot work no matter what kind of reward we use or what schedule we implement it on to get anything beyond temporary compliance because they do not help the person involved to reconstruct what's going on and develop a lasting commitment mm -hmm. to the thing in question. And in fact, the news is worse than that. Rewards like punishments undermine the, the likelihood of positive lasting change. So for example, research has found that if I took a whole bunch of kids, it's true with adults too, but let's focus on kids. Let's say mm -hmm. I took a hundred kids and I gave them all the identical puzzle to solve. And I randomly assigned them into group A and group B. And group A, I just said to them, here, see if you can figure out this puzzle. And group B, I said, here's the reward you'll get for doing this puzzle, or even more destructive as it turns out, for getting it right, for solving it successfully. It will turn out every time that the kids in group A, on average, will do a better job at solving the puzzle. This is true, as I said, also of adults. It's true of boys and girls. Mm -hmm. It's true across cultures. The use of rewards undermines the quality of learning or performance on a whole range of tasks. And its destructive effect is greater the more ingenuity or creativity or critical thinking that's required for the task. Now, it's not just true of academics and workplace assignments. Um, it's also true, for example, trying to get people to do different things in their lives. For example, studies find um, that if we want to get people to lose weight or go to the gym more mm -hmm. or quit smoking, the least successful programs are those that involve some kind of incentive, usually money, for doing those things. They can temporarily, as long as the money keeps coming, get people to lose weight, quit smoking, and so on. But as soon as the reward stops, the best case scenario is that people go back to the way they were before, but more commonly, they're worse off than they were at the beginning. Rewards, like punishments, are not just ineffective in the long term, they are actively counterproductive. I'll give you another example. A range of studies have found that children who are frequently rewarded or praised by their parents are less generous and caring than other children. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And the effect is most pronounced if they were rewarded or praised for being generous or caring. If mm. I say to a child, good job, I love the way you shared your dessert with Diane. You're such a generous person, good job. She just became a little more selfish looking to the future according to the research. And so what I spend a lot of what I spent a lot of time doing in my book, Punished by Rewards, and then updating a couple of years ago with new research, mm -hmm. is why this happens um, and, and proving that it keeps happening, that the research continuously shows rewards don't just undermine the quality of performance. Rewards make, the more you're rewarded for doing something, the more you're likely to lose interest in whatever you had to do to get the reward. Yeah. And so that helps to explain why performance goes down too. But even if it didn't, it's a tragedy in its own right because of its effect on the quality of life. I mean, that's why every study to the best of my knowledge that has looked at the effects of grades versus no grades in school has found that grades are destructive in various ways um, I can talk more about it if you want, but I think we're going to be moving in another direction in a minute. But every study I've ever found has found that children who go to traditional schools where they get letter or number grades lose interest in what they're learning compared to children lucky enough to go to schools where they don't get judged with letter or number grades. So the whole behaviorist framework not only is about conditional acceptance, it's also about um, a kind of control that leads to an evaporation of interest or commitment. Or to summarize it in slightly more technical terms, can you motivate children or adults with, with rewards if you get the reward they love most? Depends what you mean by motivation. Psychologists have been telling us for half a century there are different kinds of motivation and the kind matters more than the amount. So mm -hmm. psychologists distinguish between intrinsic motivation, which means you do something because you get a kick out of it, whether it's helping or coding or painting or whatever it is, and extrinsic motivation, which means you do something in order to get something outside extrinsic to the task, like a goodie. And it's not just that those two things are different, intrinsic and extrinsic. And it's not even just that intrinsic is better or more effective. It's that extrinsic motivators tend to destroy intrinsic motivation, even though you can maybe get temporary obedience for a moment. Right. So I learned about intrinsic motivation like a year or two ago for the first time. I had never even mm -hmm. heard the distinction. Um, and so uh, it was Dr. Rhonda Bondi from Harvard, and she was describing the ingredients necessary, uh, which she named as autonomy, belonging, competence, and meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so could you kind of like explain to us like what those things mean um, and why they're important? The um, much of the research, not all of it, but much of the research showing the inherent destructive uh, effects of rewards uh, come from a whole movement of psychologists worldwide led by um, Ed DC and Rich Ryan at the University of Rochester known as self-determination theory. Mm -hmm. And that's founded on the idea that what human beings need um, they don't include meaning in that particular framework, but it's it's fine to add or subtract things. But their their view is, you know, I, I call it ABC, changing one of them just because it's a better mnemonic. The mm -hmm. A is autonomy, which means human beings need to have some sense of control over what they do. They need to feel, as one researcher put it, like origins in their lives, not like pawns. Right. It's true for young children. You're not the boss of me, and it's true for us as well, right? Yeah. Um, but B for belongingness, sometimes called relatedness, means that human beings need to um, feel connected to others, to, to feel a sense of relationship, to, be, to care and to be cared about. Uh, that relationship is critical. And the C, competence, means that we human beings have a basic inborn need 
to get better at stuff that is personally meaningful, not, not to fill out pointless worksheets in school, but to l learn and grow in ways that make sense to us. Those basic needs, when they are ignored or subverted in some way, lead us in destructive directions. Um, just to take one provocative but, uh, but timely example of this, if people have, been gr have grown up feeling controlled by their parents and teachers, feeling like they really don't have any sense of their own lives, they may come to create this artificial warped notion of freedom or liberty that says, if you tell me I have to wear a mask to protect others, that's tyranny and I won't do it. That's an excellent idea of distinguishing between the natural and appropriate human need for autonomy on the one hand, and a pure reactive selfishness where you don't give a damn about the health needs of others or uh, yeah. what can be done for a community and so on. And you feel like, how dare you ever say no to me? And adults who are still doing that are probably those whose needs in childhood were not, were not met. The needs for autonomy, belongingness, and competence together help to create the dimensions of what we find intrinsically motivating. And when we are instead controlled and feel like we don't have much say over what's going on, um, uh, in, in that case, for example, with, with rewards or punishments or surveillance or lots of judgment, even if rewards aren't attached, then are we not having our basic needs met and then various bad things tend to happen? Yeah. Um, when talking about um, using uh, rewards and consequences or even, you know, the, the claims that this is evidence-based method, mm -hmm. um, what should people really consider, you know, what does evidence-based mean? And like, um, I've heard you like list some questions that people should ask when talking about um, like whether something works. Um, mm -hmm. So could you talk about that? Works to do what? You know, that's basically, you know, when you said to me, don't rewards work, you know, I sort of agreed. I got your shoes off. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's the case with let's let's talk about these these awful school wide programs called positive behavior support or PBIS, which is a school-wide program to control children or classroom management programs or various kinds of discipline programs that, that, kid, that parents are urged to. Some people will claim they're evidence-based and I, even before getting to wanting to see the study or studies, what do you mean by evidence? Which studies? How are they conducted? What was the sample size? What was the effect size? In other words, how much of a difference did it make? Well, what matters most is what's your dependent variable, which means, what do you mean by work? <laughs> Have an effect on what, right? So, you know, there are various school uh, programs uh, for academics teaching this way versus that way, where it's evidence-based, you know, it, it works to improve achievement. What do you mean by achievement? Well, typically it doesn't mean learning in any meaningful sense, it means raising scores on terrible standardized tests, which tend to matter to measure what matters least. Um, and the same thing is true of, of, of um, programs in classrooms or schools that are about the social, moral, behavioral aspects of schooling, where evidence-based means they got mindless obedience in the short run. They did not help kids to become independent thinkers, to become caring members of a classroom, you know, to become more morally sophisticated. Programs like Class Dojo and PBIS and other things like that were never intended to do that. They were intended to get compliance. Now, it's really interesting to look at the way behaviorists in particular sling around phrases like evidence-based, which is intended to basically close down discussion. You may not like it, the kids may not like being treated this way. Uh, there may be something that even if we didn't have the words to say, but it kills intrinsic motivation or but it's conditional acceptance. We kind of knew intuitively there's something yucky about this. Mm 
Yeah. And we're basically told to shut up because it's evidence-based. And the studies that behaviorists do with heirs, and we're going to walk our way to this, but I, since you asked about it, let me jump, particularly with the most full-strength concentrate version, the most toxic, intense use of behaviorism to manipulate children and ignore their experience is something that's done particularly with kids on the spectrum called applied behavior analysis or ABA. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get more outrageous than this. And there are various reasons, and I'll run through them in a minute if you'd like me to, yeah, why I think this program is so morally outrageous in the way it treats children. But when you raise those concerns, the response is always it's evidence-based or even more out audaciously, it's the only intervention that's evidence-based. And that was never true, but now we know it isn't true because one of the most prestigious psychology journals called Psychological Bulletin, mm -hmm. which does reviews of many, many studies together to see what the state of the science is, published a report on treatments of kids with autism this past January and found that most of the studies that behaviorists cite to show that ABA is evidence-based are so poorly conducted that experts in data analysis said they're not even worthy of being considered in a review of adequate science on the subject. For example, a lot of the behaviorist studies are of a single subject, one kid before and after, right. which is problematic, as you can imagine, because you can't generalize to the experience of other children and so on. Um, and even when they do group studies, they typically don't randomly, the behaviorists doing a, who are partial already to ABA, because they're, this is a religion, it's not a science. Um, and they, they sometimes use parent and teacher reports as evidence that it works, which makes no sense because they're already skewed to wanting it to work and are not able to give you an objective account of it. And they don't randomly assign the kids. But when they found a few of those studies and then compared it to studies of other interventions, they decided that ABA did not even deserve the, did not even merit the description of a promising approach. In fact, they found the two other approaches, uh, which are, I don't, I don't know very much about one of them, but the one I do know called DIR floor time, started by the late psychiatrist Stanley Greenspan, is the exact opposite of ABA, because what it most appreciates is the relationships with children, how they differ and what their experiences are. And it turns out that's not only a lot nicer as a way to treat kids, it works better. ABA only appears to if you take the behaviorist word for it, but when the experts come along and look at it, the claim of being evidence-based evaporates. And I, I encourage people to look at the psych bulletin piece, but even apart from this, there are reasons. I mean, look, the whole, Everything I've we've we've been talking about for you know for half an hour, people will nod and say, yeah, well, okay, intrinsic motivation, unconditional acceptance sounds good, except for those kids, yeah, kids with special needs, with special challenges, everything gets put aside, and we find ourselves thinking we have uh, uh, um, that it's appropriate to treat those children, even mandatory mm -hmm. to treat those children in ways we would never treat neurotypical kids. And it turns out that while I understand the seduction of a one size fits all, train them as if they were pets approach, just focus on behavior, measure the impact, change the protocol for the reinforcement schedule, any idiot basically can do that, to, can do a, a doing to approach like this. In order to figure out a working with approach, particularly with kids who are not very verbal, who are reactive, who have sensitivity concerns about the environment, who may lash out, 
whose mind works in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to come up with a working with approach there takes time and it takes talent and it takes care and it takes courage. Yeah. Because sometimes you have to ask if the kid didn't do what I wanted, could the problem not be with the kid, but with what I wanted? That takes yeah. guts. You don't need any talent, time, care, or courage to dangle a doggy biscuit in front of a kid. And so many of us, and particularly therapists who are trained this way, you know, you've heard the expression, if all you have is a hammer, you treat everything you come across as if it's a nail. Mm -hmm. So the whole world is reconfigured and reframed in behaviorist terms. And so they have to figure out some way to dismiss all the, all, all the, I mean, look, there's been evidence with kids with other special, kids with attention deficit disorder, kids with learning disabilities for years, showing that rewards tend to backfire with those kids the way they do with everybody else, ultimately, right. especially right. if you're looking at long range stuff, kids, because it doesn't get to the source of the problem. But this is, this is a minority report in this country. My late friend, uh, an expert on, on these issues named Herb Lovett, whose books I recommend very highly, especially one called Learning to Listen, used to say that the only problem with special education in this country is it's not special and it sure as hell isn't education, you know? Yeah. And I think like, so a lot of the problems here seem to stem from, um, I mean, this sort of information isn't necessarily divulged um, to families. That's right. Um, even, you know, I, I'm really not sure how many people in the field really fully realize these things either. And, you know, autistic people have been saying for decades now, you know, as soon as they had the capacity to like get on social media and probably even before that, yeah. you know, that this is hurtful to them and it's for a lot of reasons, but it, it seems to overwhelmingly be that a, there's like a mismatch in neurotype and, you know, communication differences, number one. So there's like a priority put on kind of making someone act in neurotypical ways and, you know, learn neurotypical skills and, you know, it sort of kind of stems from like some ableism in our society of, you know, you need to be able to do this and independence is what's important. Um, but the reality is that, you know, when you're just focused on changing the behavior and just teaching a skill, but you're not actually understanding the like underlying neurology and needs of a person, it's actually quite damaging. And it turns out that many people who have gone through these types of therapies have a major problem with it. And one of the biggest problems that I have seen is that it's compliance-based. And yes. so you learn that you, you're not allowed to say no. And, and you get pushback even if you question that. No, they can say no, but having two bad options is not really having no. the ability to say no. And if you're not being, if your needs aren't being met, then that's a problem. Um, yes. So In fact, I think you're putting it kind of mildly here, Jen. It's not just a mismatch, you know, uh, and it's not just the failure to meet needs here. And, and here I have to say mea culpa, like you said, you hadn't heard the, inter the term intrinsic motivation. Let me tell you what I was embarrassed to discover only about a year ago. Mm -hmm. ABA is almost universally loathed by the autistic children to whom it's been done. Yes. There are websites, Twitter feeds, Facebook pages, scholarly articles, um, popular articles, blog posts by young adults who are autistic obviously those with the capacity to communicate this, maybe in many cases on behalf of those who can't. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find any of them who are not, and I'm gonna say this strongly, still shaking, yeah. still shuddering from the yeah. lifelong trauma as a result of what ABA has done to them. And it is mind blowing 
It does not speak well for us as a society that their response, their perspective is dismissed. I yes. mean, in an article I wrote on this topic, you know, I, I use the analogy of if we were thinking we were helping the homeless and it turned out that, that homeless people uniformly, you know, detested a particular strategy that was being used, what would it say about us if that did not stop us in our tracks? Yeah. And I, I quote from a number of autistic men and women who describe exactly why they, they are going to spend their lifetimes recovering from the unbelievably exhausting tens of hours of a week of training children like, like pets. Now, part of the problem is that the whole philosophy of ABA, and this could be true of other interventions as well, is, and I think this is something you were getting at, um, is really not meant to do what's in the best interest of the autistic child. It's meant to make the neurotypical adults around them less uncomfortable by the way that some autistic kids act, the way they squeal, the way they flap their hands, um, the way they rock the things that they're doing. And um, the, the attempt, ABA is not about how can we help these, find who these kids are and help them be what they can be. It's about saying to them, stop being who you are. And a lot of autistic people refer to ABA as analogous to gay conversion therapy. We're gonna make you normal, that is straight. And that's, that's not a, a strained analogy because Lovas, the main guy who came up with ABA also did gay conversion therapy. But then there's the aspects even beyond that of what is so problematic about ABA um, beyond the, the fact that they try to stop them from being who they are. One is that it's just dehumanizing. It's objectifying. I, I mean, I, you heard me say, you know, like treating kids like pets. <laughs> I have to stop myself every time I say that because there's a blog post by a woman who's a dog trainer who says, <laughs> I would never treat dogs the way ABA treats autistic children. Yeah. Uh, but it's so it's that dehumanizing. Second, it ignores the experience and internal life. You know, it's about kids need to feel safe and ABA just eliminates the unusual ways that children try to attain the safety by like praising them for quiet hands and garbage like that. Third, it creates dependence. If you spend hours a week teaching a small child, you know, that he gets a reward only when he suppresses his own preferences and does exactly what he's told, that squelches autonomy, which is one of the basic human needs for all kids, typical neurotypical or not. And it also creates a kind of passivity, potentially lifelong. Um, next, it, it communicates conditional acceptance, teaching kids they're worthwhile only when they obey, which is subliminally present in all ABA, uh, that they have to mask or suppress their impulses to pass as normal creates both anxiety and shame. And then fifth is what you mentioned maybe you were gonna to get to the others too, which is that ABA is about compliance. Sometimes it's even called compliance training. Mm -hmm. So I wanna emphasize this, the problem is not just with the method of, um, of, of ABA, just like with positive behavior supports and other behaviorist trappings. Um, the problem is with the goal. The point was never to do what was in the child's best interest. It's to get them to obey. Like, like all forms of rewards and punishments, it's more powerful people using this as a tool to get compliance from less powerful people. And I want to emphasize everything that I've said about ABA is inherent to ABA when it's done the correct way. This is not because this is the immediate pushback you get when you do a yeah. criticism of almost anything, not just ABA. Oh, well, 
Not everybody who claims they're doing it is doing it right, or there's variation in the fidelity of implementation or what have you, or you just have to tweak the technique. No, this, these critiques and the evaluation of the evidence about behind it is about what it is inherently. And it's not only true of ABA, it's true of rewards more generally, as I think I said a few moments ago, that the problem is not with the way we're doing it. The problem is with the problematic assumptions, deeply flawed and outdated assumptions about human psychology on which all rewards and punishments are based. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> I think, and this like, it's almost a form of um, gaslighting in some ways that, hmm. you know, if you question this, you know, and, and I don't doubt that anyone who is in any of these fields with children want to help children. And no, think I don't that, doubt that either. You know, so it, it like, I want to be very clear that we're not like attacking people here, but you know, these ideas have to be considered. And I've always told my husband that this, it almost reminds me of the quote from Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park when he says, you know, we were so busy thinking about whether we could that we could didn't do it, yeah. whether we should. Right. And, you know, I just, it's still so hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that despite the objections from the community and despite the brain science, and also just to throw in one extra piece of information here is that there's no neuroscience or child development in much of this coursework that, you know, behaviorists are implementing with these children. And so, you know, if you don't really understand the brain or autism, like why, like, why is this still continuing? Why isn't it changing? Why are experts, you know, suggesting to parents that we do 20 to 40 hours a week with our children. Um, I, I just, I can't really wrap my head around this, that it's, it's just continuing. And, and there's so much information available now. Um, I don't live my world, my life in the world of, um, of autism. And I want to be clear, I'm not a clinician or an expert in autism. And there may be, I mean, I found my way to it from my understanding of psychological issues and research more generally. Um, so there may be explanations to why the hell are we still doing this to children that are specific to ABA, that are political, the way that sometimes ABA has managed to lobby effectively enough that they're actually mandated by legislatures and school districts. And I don't understand the practicalities of how that's done. For me, this is a subset of the larger question. If a reward and punishment approach is not only ineffective, but counterproductive across the board yeah. with all kids yeah. uh, and, and families, with all students in schools, with employees in the workplace, Incidentally, to the best of my knowledge, no controlled scientific study has ever found a long-term enhancement in the quality of work in any kind of workplace as a result of any kind of incentive plan, pay for performance scheme, bonus plan, and so on. Um, you just get a temporary kick in the, in the quantity of what you've produced and at a terrific cost again. Yeah. So the interesting question for me, and it's a useful one that you ask, because how do we make change? How do we open minds until we understand why we're still stuck in this, despite the overwhelming evidence against it? Um, and by the way, some of that evidence, I was talking about autistic young adults looking back and shuddering at their experience being ABA'd. But uh, in an article I wrote about this called Autism and Behaviorism, which is available on my website, uh, I wrote it a few months ago, there... There's also testimony by, I think I've used at least three ex-ABA trainers who are now doing the mea culpa. I can't believe I ever treated children like this, you know? Yeah. And, and, they, and they talk in much more specific terms than, than I'm able to about just how horrifying it is, uh, how they had trouble living with themselves, treating children. And whenever they complained, they were told, 
as if they were in a cult, you know, to swallow their objections or it's evidence-based, it's good for the child, it's the only thing that works and so on. You know, one, one person talked about how first you find out what the child loves most, you know, favorite mm -hmm. toy, video game, and then you hold it for ransom. I, I just, what, what a striking way of putting it. That's the yeah. ultimate in conditionality. Yeah. Right? yeah and they have to. You know, sorry, I, it's the opposite of strength based learning, which, you know, has a lot of uh, research behind it now and is also something that the community feels is, you know, much yeah. more worthy and respectful and. Uh huh boost intrinsic motivation. Um, and one like last thing that I just really wanted to point out here is um, the other thing with autistic students or any vulnerable person is that the abuse rates, the abuse rates are much higher in vulnerable people, yes, especially females. And so for me, that is another reason that we really need to examine what we're doing and what the long-term implications are. And as a parent, like I am always thinking about, you know, how is this going to affect her long-term? Because I'm, I'm as the parents, we're with the children for their whole lives or our whole lives at least. Yes. You know, and so I, I appreciate that, you know, people need to manage classrooms and manage their households. But I guess what I'm asking is like, we need to just really think about and try to question these things because there's so much at stake. Um, That's right. And, and to make sure we're all, we're focusing on the long-term, not just the short-term with all children. When I do a workshop with parents or teachers, I typically start by asking, what are your long-term goals for your kids? Yeah. How do you want them to turn out years from now? Um, and then what I do for a living is I say to people, you say you want this, why are you doing that? Yeah. After presenting evidence that many of our common practices in families and in classrooms make it actually less likely that you'll be able to reach with those kids your goals, never mind mine. Yeah. You know? And so, for example, one study found that autistic kids were significantly more likely to have post-traumatic stress symptoms if they ever had ABA done to them. That's just one example of how real evidence, not behaviorist pseudo evidence, real evidence shows that there is indeed reason to worry. And the more we're focused on what you just talked about, which is the long term, mm -hmm. so horizontally speaking, what's, what's out there, and then vertically speaking, what's underneath the behavior, to, work, to think about both, not just the behavior today, but the whole child and forever, the more urgent it becomes to reject any remnant of this sort of rat training stuff that's going on. Uh, by the way, when you asked, so how come we're still doing it? I didn't really get around to answering that quickly. One reason is because for many people, it's all we know. It's yeah. not because we're malicious. Right. It's not because we don't love our children. It's because in many cases, no one has ever introduced us, A, to this kind of critique and what the evidence really says, contrary to the behaviorist claims, and B, introduced us to other, what I call working with approaches that are more constructive, respectful, and effective. Mm -hmm. So if it's all we know, that's one reason. Another reason is it's expected. It's not just accepted in places, it's expected. Mm -hmm. This is sometimes the only game in town. If his parent says, my child is, is autistic, what do I do? And we're told it's called ABA. And it's not even on a menu, you know, so that would, that's, that's what you do. And if you criticize it, you, you already are struggling to figure out how to do what's right by your kid. Now you have to be a salmon swimming against the current and yeah. challenging people, some of whom have fancy degrees, telling you you're wrong. Uh, this is what you have to do for your kid. And a lot of people capitulate. Yeah. Another reason is because, as we keep saying, it works. In the short run, sometimes to get temporary compliance. And if in the long term, it's not only failing to be effective, but actually doing damage, there's a dotted line connecting the reward-based approach 
to those long-term disturbing consequences. So you can see that it, you can make the kid, you know, make eye contact if that's what you're trying to do, if you've shaped that behavior for a little bit mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 or stop making certain noises, just like I can get your shoes off. But the enormous damage, never mind the, the opportunity costs, as economists call them, meaning the, what you've missed using that opportunity to respond and support and unconditionally love and develop a relationship with and respond to the needs, you don't see that. that. So as a result, if, as the behaviorists would say, you've reinforced the stuff that appears to work for now that's visible and you're not making change because you don't see how dreadful it is ultimately. So those are some of the reasons. And, and then I guess I would add to what I said before, training kids like pets is asks a lot less of us than a working with approach. So the fact that it seems to be easier is another reason why it persists, not only in the form of ABA, but with reward and punishment based approaches for kids in general. Yeah. So the last thing I really wanted to cover is um, there's a difference between independence and autonomy. Yes. So could you tell us what that difference is and why is it so important? Well, in a way, it gets back to the example I gave of the people loudly, you know, and nastily refusing to wear masks uh, during a pandemic. These are people who reflect a kind of distorted funhouse mirror version of independence and the kind of individualism that reaches cartoonish per proportions in the United States compared to most places around the globe to the exclusion of connection with others, uh, sharing values and, and the value of what is shared. Uh, uh, autonomy is that psychological need, that sense of um, I need to have some say over my own life. That's something I argue that all human beings, typical, neurotypical or not, child or, or adult, there ha may have to be limits and structures, yeah. you know, it's not saying anything goes, but um, having a sense of this is me and I get to decide who I am with your help and support and judgment as a parent or teacher. That's real autonomy. But in many, in most parts of the world, the value of independence does not eclipse the value of interdependence. Mm. It's mostly in America where interdependence is something you're supposed to grow out of. And we do this with with, with all kids, so sit up straight, use a fork, you're a big boy now. No, I'm not gonna carry you, you're, you're old enough to walk now. You know, and then, you know, heaven help us if we have a young adult child who still needs our support, you know, emotionally, financially, or, or, or what have you, that's failure to launch. We're helicopter parents if we're still providing support because maturity and uh, successful uh, development are defined in terms of self-sufficiency. Yeah. That is not supported by the psychological research on autonomy. That is a kind of political ideology that is in our blood in this country. Um, and that's why, and there are young adults, for example, who are very independent in their lives. Um, they're living on their own, um, and yet they don't have a good psychological sense of autonomy. There are various ways in which they're still dependent on the judgment of others, for example. And conversely, there are young adults who are quite autonomous and very healthy psychologically, but they're not all that independent. They're right. still closely connected to, to others around them. So it's very important just to tease those things apart and make sure we're, we're not over emphasizing the value of, especially to the exclusion of other values of independence. That's a message that clonks us on the head if we happen to have children with disabilities. 
you know, where total independence suddenly isn't even an option and we're forced to think, wow, I'm going to have to rethink my, my whole values here. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean we have failed them. And that's true even of kids without traditionally defined disabilities as well, that we should be rethinking um, the assumption that we are, we're over, we're overvaluing the idea of self-sufficiency. Yeah. I, it's something I have thought long and hard over myself. And for me, it's, you know, my priority is for her to have autonomy. You know, we want our kids to be, to feel happy and fulfilled and, you know, feel that they can make things happen for themselves. So. Right. Know, I mean, one maybe a good way to, to wrap this up is to, is here's another distinction. Um, many parents and teachers begin with the question, how do I get this child or these kids, students, to do what I want? Mm -hmm. And others begin with the question, what does this child, what do these kids need? And how can I meet those needs? And, you know, we may have disagreements about possible answers to those two questions. Well, what strategies are best at getting them to do what you want? And what do they need? And how can we meet those needs? But it's almost the answers to the question don't matter as much as which question you're asking. Yeah. You know, ABA and get job and star charts and grades are answers to the question, how do I get the kids to do what I tell them? That's what ABA is about. Yeah. Right. And you get a whole different set of possible strategies, not one size fits all scripts and surefire solutions and treasure maps, but ways of thinking about these things that are totally different, never involving rewards and punishments, bribes and threats. If the question you started with is, what does this child need? You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's hard, but it's worth it. Okay, well, Alfie, um, I so appreciate you coming today. We are so happy to have you. Um, again, I people are probably going to be a little uncomfortable um, with uh, some of the things that we discussed, and you know, and that's okay. I think we have to try to like lean into that discomfort. So that oh, yeah. right, that's where the learning comes from, not from the stuff you already believed coming in, right? Yeah, yeah. We're gonna put up links uh, to your website. Um, and to, you know, some of the, the um, articles that you mentioned as well. So Good. I appreciate your inviting me. It takes a little gumption to bring on somebody who you know <laughs> is going to shake things up, you know. <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.